Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Hiring for Scale, Make Smarter Hiring Decisions with Recruiting Analytics. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have a few administrative details to share with you, and then we'll dig into our discussion. First, we would like to thank GEM for their partnership to, with today's event. They've been wonderful thought leadership partners to Argyle and are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. So thank you again to GEM. We appreciate your joining us today. We welcome you to stay connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum. I also wanted to take a minute to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on feedback we've received over the years from our members. Argyle is very proud and protective of this policy as it reflects our commitment to ensure the neutrality and overall value of the content presented at our events. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. Finally, and most importantly, please submit all questions that come up during today's event into the chat section of the interface. Following the panel discussion, we've set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on these questions. Before we start our discussion, I'd like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Andon, why don't we start with you? Yes, hello. My name is Andon Cowie, and I lead global recruiting at Grammarly. Nice to see everybody. Matt, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you may be in the world. My name is uh, Matt Tague. I'm the Director of Customer Advisory at GEM, uh, former Lyft, former Microsoft, former LinkedIn. Excited to be here today. Great. Thank you. Well, Matt, why don't we uh, start with your presentation? Awesome. Thank you, Eric. All right. Fantastic. So just to go ahead and kick off, uh, I'd like to just do a quick intro of GEM for those that may not be uh, familiar with us and our, our journey thus far. Uh, so GEM, you know, we've been around since 2017. Uh, we are the platform for modern recruiting. And so our product uh, and our platform helps companies with a variety of things. Uh, some of those include talent reporting and insights, talent engagement, diversity recruiting, and a whole lot more. So as we kick off today, I'm going to be showing you kind of what some of that looks like uh, to give you a sneak preview and talk about how some of the companies uh, that we work with and I get to work with every day in my role are using GEM uh, today. Uh, so moving forward, just to set the stage, I think, you know, everyone's experiencing this likely on the call. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, but it still bears repeating that uh, hiring is hard today. And I think we all acutely feel that in our roles, whether we be leaders or recruiters or sourcers or whatever our role in talent organizations may be. But 60% of companies, according to Deloitte, are struggling to find qualified candidates. Uh, I saw this morning that there are 290,000 recruiter roles open in the U.S. alone. Uh, so it's never been a great, better time to be a recruiter. It's never been a harder time to be a recruiter. Uh, but this is a lot, a lot of these challenges that we're seeing in the market uh, generally. And so with that, we've all heard talk of the great migration, the great resignation. Uh, but I actually want to shift that a little bit and just kind of piggyback on some of the great work our current customers, uh, a subset among them here, uh, to shift that a little bit to this concept of the great attraction, right? So while it is hard and companies are struggling to fill roles both in the US and globally, uh, we're seeing a lot of companies are taking a new view on that and really shifting their mindset to it being a focus on the great attraction versus the great resignation. Uh, so these are some examples of the companies that we work with that have uh, kind of engaged in this paradigm shift to all of this talent is out there. How do we go out and proactively attract that talent to our companies at scale? And so that's really where, where GEM comes in. Uh, so GEM as a company, you know, we, we essentially uh, saw as an issue our founders did when they began GEM that a lot of the ATS work previously had been focused on inbound, right? So that's you know, direct applicants, referrals, uh, internal applicants. And while those channels continue to be incredibly important, uh, for the work that we all do in talent acquisition teams, increasingly we're seeing a greater reliance on outbound sourcing. Uh, we see that you know inbound you know is is great and it works when it works well, but when you couple that with you know in demand roles like data scientists, engineers, uh, and any of those other roles that exist in the different industries we recruit in, 
inbound just isn't quite enough to, to meet the, the, the needs that we all have in our organizations. Uh, when you layer on diversity recruiting on top of that, that becomes even more acute. Uh, the challenges that we face uh, in, in terms of uh, getting access to and also attracting diverse talent at scale is something that a lot of us are struggling with today. Uh, and so GEM is really purpose built to help companies uh, meet those demands and also, and also capitalize on this great attraction scenario that's happening today. So what, what is GEM? In a nutshell, uh, we provide different values for uh, different personas, including recruiters, hiring managers, recruiting ops, leadership, and DEI professionals. But you can fundamentally think of us as kind of two areas where we provide value. So one is on talent engagement. Uh, and so this is a little bit focused on how you identify and then also attract this passive talent at scale. Uh, we do that through very robust nurture campaigns, uh, SMS functionality, the ability to overlay on key talent portals like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, and Indeed, and also with a direct integration with uh, uh, Office 365, G Suite, and several core ATS partners, including Workday, Greenhouse, Lever, and Smart Recruiters. So today we're not going to deep dive on the talent engagement piece. We are going to spend a lot of time on the data-driven recruiting and analytics tools that GEM brings to bear. Uh, so essentially what we do, and we'll be demoing this in a moment here, we actually will combine with the ATS data that your organization has, but we'll be able to show you a much fuller picture, right? So traditionally, when you think about data-driven recruiting, most of it has been focused on the hiring funnel, everything that happens from application to hire. But what's been missing is that top of funnel picture, right? Where, where are the outreaches taking place? How many responses are we getting? What's the volume of work that's being done in terms of proactive sourcing. Uh, with GEM, you're able to see that in one unified view that helps you move uh, from prediction to realization to understand where your sourcing efforts are working, where they're not working as well, uh, and where they need to be improved going forward. And so this is kind of the two key things that we want to leave you with today that the GEM uh, can help you with is this talent engagement piece and also data-driven recruiting. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the data-driven recruiting piece. Uh, and to do that, we're going to introduce a small framework. So this is very simple, but this will provide a basis for the demo we'll walk through in a moment here. Uh, and basically, you know, in my work with customers at GEM, we often use this a lot. And it's a three-part framework of discover, analyze, and act. Uh, historically, in TA orgs, this has been very difficult to do because data is fractured. You know, it's been sitting on spreadsheets uh, with VLOOKUPs among VLOOKUPs. Uh, and it's been very difficult to get a real-time picture of what's actually happening in talent orgs. And so with GEM, as we'll show you in a moment, you're able to quickly discover, uh, formulate a hypothesis to see what might be going on in your hiring funnel, uh, analyze it, quickly see what's actually happening uh, in any way you want to slice it, and then most importantly, formulate a plan from that analysis and that discovery. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and jump into the product and I'll show you a couple of exa examples of how customers are using it today to be able to realize this value uh, right now. So let me go ahead and shift this here. Bear with me one second. All right, excellent. So we're going to jump now into the GEM platform. Uh, and so there's a lot of things to cover in here. I'm going to be focusing today on one kind of core area called pipeline analytics. And so what Pipeline Analytics does is it brings your ATS data into GEM uh, and then overlays it with all of your company's sourcing activity so that you can see that full picture that we've been talking about. So maybe, for example, you want to understand, uh, you know, what, what hiring is actually taking place by department. So with GEM, we're able to quickly and easily drill down to see what that looks like, right? So if I look here, I'm going to set my time frame to the current fiscal year, right? So I'm just setting the time frame that we're looking at here, right? And then I'm able to break all of this hiring data down in very powerful ways, very quickly and efficiently. Uh, so one way that we'll do that quickly here is by department. And this might look different for different companies. You might have pipelines, you might have a slightly different way of looking at it, but I think you'll be able to follow along. And so you'll see here, I'm able to pull in all of the hiring data that's been happening for each department, right? And so this is going to automatically calculate for me each department's real-time pass-through rates, the hiring outcomes, uh, and also any specific drop-offs to be aware of between stages. 
right? So customers that I work with use this all the time to start to debug their, their processes and to think about how they can recruit better uh, as a team. And so one example of this looking here, you can see in engineering. So I'm gonna highlight this row here. So you can see here uh, that there's a 24% uh, pass-through rate from phone interview to on-site. So of course, we'd need to dig in deeper to understand the why behind this, but your eye is immediately drawn to the fact that if we were to improve this one part of the hiring process, we might be able to hire more engineering talent faster. Um, so these are the type of insights we are able to quickly produce and share with business partners to understand uh, the value that we can drive with them as talent partners here. Uh, moving to a separate example here, maybe you want to dig deeper. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at uh, a different way of slicing this data. So maybe you want to understand you have different channels that you work with, whether that's referrals, sourcing, uh, direct hires through your website, or specific job boards. We can also take a look at that. So another example is I might wonder uh, which job boards actually work. Uh, I, might, I might be a TA leader and I might have a budget uh, that I'm spending on different job boards and I might be interested to understand which ones are actually yielding hires. So I can do that quickly and easily in the GEM platform here uh, simply by clicking uh, source here. And then I'm going to add a filter here for source type and I'm going to choose third-party job boards. This is going to give me a, a readout of all of the third-party job boards that have been used for this company for the past year. Uh, and what this does is you'll see it automatically breaks down all of the hiring sliced by job board. Uh, many, many folks on the call may have tried to do this with spreadsheets or with Tableau or different combos of those things. The power here is that this is all real-time live data that can be pulled in seconds. Uh, so this is, it really helps us as leaders to translate this data into action here. So an example, just looking at this here, you can see really important insights like LinkedIn ad postings are the most effective uh, way for this company to hire their talent, right? So if they were looking to spend money on ads, that might be a good place to consider continuing to spend money there. Uh, conversely, they might look at things like uh, Google job search or other niche job sites like work at a startup that, that may not have yielded as much in terms of output there. So you can use this to prioritize you know, your spend on certain tools or also to direct your teams to help them understand which tools or which channels are actually gonna help them make hires faster, which at the end of the day is what we're all, we're all looking to do. Um, so that's another example of how companies would use a tool like this to, to get real value and to share this with business partners here. Uh, another example that I wanna bring up that I think is really powerful is around diversity. Uh, so diversity data is notoriously hard to work with uh, across companies. And I think many of us on the call have had challenges and in meetings trying to cobble together the data to, to paint a story of, of what is happening uh, and more importantly, what we want to do to improve diversity outreach. But we're able to, again, do that very quickly and easily here. So I'm just looking at this company's hiring data for the year. Uh, and then I can go into here and I can select gender. Right. And this will automatically break down for me at the company level. In this case, all of the male applicants, all of the female applicants and help me show what's actually happening in that funnel there. So we can look at things like that. We can even go deeper to look at it uh, by department, right? So if we wanted to look at for a specific business leader, what was happening from a gender perspective, we could sort by department and then we could then even further filter down to gender here, right? So you can see different trends here. Uh, so for example, uh, you can see that, that there is uh, some, some differences in the funnel uh, for both men and women in the sales department. Uh, and then you can also see here for engineering, right? That there's also some differences in the funnel, right? So you see from the phone, phone interview to the onsite that uh, women are passing that at 17% versus male candidates at 28%. So if you were a DEI professional or a recruiter working on the engineering uh, uh, pipeline there, you might come to the table with some recommendations about how to shift the interview process, how to think about it differently, uh, maybe really start to dig in to debug 
uh, what that's going to look like to improve this number here. Um, one of the other really powerful things that I want to show you is that we can help teams kind of predict and forecast what those changes actually look like here. So let's say, for example, we're looking at this 17% here. What if we were to raise that to 25%? So maybe we changed the way that we did some coding exercises uh, or we changed uh, so that we had more of an information session at the beginning of the process. We could try a variety of things, but we can set a, a data-based goal of how we want to improve this process. Uh, so GEM allows you to quickly and easily go into a pipeline forecast here. Uh, so we can go to this, this here, and again, we're just looking at the data for female candidates for engineering. So we have a very quick uh, way to parse down to the data that we need here. So if we were able to change this to 25, we can see right, that we would have to reach out to far fewer candidates to get that higher. right? So at 25, we can see it will highlight we need 206 candidates, whereas at the uh, current rate, we need 298 candidates. So what we see companies doing are taking insights like this, uh, sharing these with their business stakeholders, and also you know, attaching a dollar value to this. So if we only need 200 candidates to get a hire versus you know, approximately 300, that's a real dollar savings to the business, uh, and that gets their attention uh, surely. So this is another way that companies are, are using this today uh, to be able to understand you know, what's happening there. Um, one other example that I want to show that I think folks might find helpful is about understanding uh, the, the, the efficiency of your sourcing. So as I mentioned, we can show you the full funnel outreach here. So what we're going to look, look at here is all of your hiring funnel. Let me just change this here. All right, so this is showing all of the GEM data that includes the outreach of your teams as well as the hiring outcomes. So this is something that has not been possible before with, with any product that I've worked with and, and is what most attracted me to join GEM is that now we can finally see by department, by job, by geography, by, by diversity breakdown, what it actually takes to get a hire from a sourcing perspective. So you can see quickly and easily to get one sales hire you're going to need to send out 491 outreaches uh, to get that higher, right? So we can use this to either set goals for ourselves uh, or our teams to really make sure that we're in line with the, the planned forecast that we have as a team to actually hit our hiring goals here. Um, you can also start to look at and prioritize which teams are harder to source for and which teams are relatively easier to source for. Uh, so you can see here, for example, with this company, only one in 47 candidates are actually getting hired for engineering for sourced candidates. Contrast that with the people team where one in 16 are getting hired, right? So we can think about this with these insights to think through how many recruiters do I want on each of these teams? How much do I want them focused on sourcing versus other activities? These types of insights and data can really help uh, to inform that. So this is another way that companies are using this uh, to get value every day from this product here. So with that, we've shown you several kind of key examples uh, about diversity, about understanding your, your efficiency of your funnel, about understanding uh, the tools that you're using and the channels that you're using. I, I wanna leave you with the fact that this took uh, several seconds to pull these together versus hours uh, or weeks even in some cases. And so that's really the power that we can bring to bear to help companies be smarter uh, and to help them hit their hiring goals at scale. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand that back uh, to Eric. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, before we start in on our discussion questions, we do have a quick poll, which will populate on the right hand side of your screen, asking if individuals want a personalized demo of GEM. So while you know the poll will be on the side of the screen for a, a while, and you're welcome to fill that in um, when that's convenient for you. So why don't we start with our first question? And this question is for Andon. And that's that Grammarly has grown really fast since you joined. How do you achieve high volume hiring goals? Yeah, great. Um, so I think the first thing is planning. So uh, we always want to think about you know, the short term planning. but We also want to think about the long term planning. 
So I understand that companies frequently change. Uh, there may be some business objectives that change. And so planning is possibly going to change as well, but having at least that North Star number of what you should be looking to hire within the next year or two can really set recruiting up for success and be able to plan towards that number opposed to be reactive towards that number. So that is the, the, the first thing that we try to do at Grammarly is, is we're lucky enough to have both that North Star number, but also do more individual planning and in, in what we call, uh, maybe like you would call it sprints, right? Um, the second thing is prioritization. So really understanding where you want to focus your time in terms of the roles that you want to focus on, the functions that you want to support, et cetera. Um, what level does each role need in terms of focus? So one of the things that we did at Grammarly, and it's it's still kind of in the works, it's not a perfect scenario, is we get a list of roles every quarter and we make sure we find, uh, we dedicate a different level of support to each role. We might dedicate a primary support to specific roles, which is you know the full gamut from sourcing to closing. And that's the level of support recruiting might focus on. But we also don't want to hinder some of the volume or scalable efforts that a hiring manager might do or other folks that might just come through our funnel for different roles. So we may add a different level of support for those specific roles. And that helps us focus on the roles that are critical for us but also helps us grow and increase volume over time. Um, and the last thing is, is just build an incredible recruiting team. Anytime you're in a hyper growth uh, type of company, uh, recruiting capacity is always gonna be your biggest challenge. It's always gonna be a problem. You're never gonna be able to hit the goals of the business without building that recruiting team. Um, and I, I think uh, one of the, the luxuries I had at Grammarly is the executives and leadership team understood that. They understood that the longer it takes to build out that core team, the longer it's gonna to take to be able to get us to a pace that we'll need in the hiring. And it's, it's still not accomplished yet, right? But the longer we do that, the longer it's gonna take. And so taking that time to really build that core team is, is very key. Thank you. Um, the next question is also for Andon, and that is, what are some challenges that you've had to overcome to meet the needs of global scaling? Yeah, I, um, it's funny because I actually were interviewing a lot of uh, team members, uh, recruiting team members right now, and, and I get this question pretty regular. Um, and my quick response is, what day are you talking about? Um, it's constantly changing. It's constantly moving. There's different challenges depending on the scale. Um, but if I could just you know, reflect on my experience in my almost three years at Grammarly. Um, again, I think, and also just uh, my previous experience is, again, to echo my point around recruiting capacity, um, don't stop building an incredible team. Build an incredible team so you're catching up with capacity as quick as possible. Um, that is one. The other thing is partner communication is what I like to call it. And that is, how are you staying in tune with the hiring teams, the stakeholders within the company. Um, we send frequent planning updates, we send recruiting news, and ultimately we send also quarterly recaps with data and frequent reporting. Um, and that way we can kind of debunk maybe some of the anecdotal things that might come out of you know, different scenarios. Um, and this is a way that allows, I think, us to grow together uh, instead of this uh, mentality of like, hey, what is recruiting doing for us? It's more about we're partnering all together. We're a partner in this. Here's our challenges. Here's where we need to overcome. And staying in line with that constant communication as you grow, uh, in my mind, is very crucial. Um, the final thing is the data, right? The, the data, data, data. Um, and that is big for us. And that's one of the things that I did when I first started is really understanding that data. Um, I'm not a believer in... Uh, using your past experience from a leadership mentality and saying, hey, it worked at this company, let's go put it in this company and let it work. I think every scale of company is going to have different challenges. And what we did uh, from a global perspective is I pulled the funnel from different locations uh, and ultimately did exploratory chats with stakeholders, used the data and the exploratory chats, plus talked to the recruiting team members to understand just some really big rocks that we found that could we be improved on. And it's actually different per location we found. So one location had a sourcing issue, another location had a closing issue. 
And being able to figure that out allowed us to put in solutions and solve that. The biggest thing I would say around that is uh, clean the data. Get your level of data integrity clean as quick as possible as you grow. Great, thank you. This next, next question is from Matt. And the question is, a modern recruiting analytics system collects an enormous amount of data. What data do you use to establish a baseline for your team? And how do you set expectations for recruiting teams? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think first and foremost, I would encourage folks that are diving into recruiting data for the first time or are somewhat newer to it, is don't get bogged down by the complexity. Uh, start simple. Start with uh, simple things like, like time to hire. Uh, some of the things that we looked at in the demo, looking at a department level or a pipeline level, uh, to really understand what's going on. Because if you don't know where you are, it's hard to chart a path to where you want to go. Uh, so I think the, the other thing that I would look at that I, I, I uh, work with customers a lot to do is to really break down the taxonomy to what matters. So you get an apples to apples comparison. So a lot of times companies will, will make the mistake of looking at the data in aggregate. So they'll look at all of their hiring, uh, which doesn't really tell you the, the nuance that you need to make some of those decisions uh, and planning choices that, that Andon mentioned uh, in his answer there. Uh, so I would look at, you know, for your specific company, are you do you want to look at departments? Do you want to break those down into pipelines uh, within each department, whether that's, you know, front end or back end engineers or mobile engineers or product manager, like whatever that looks like for your company, taking the time to really map that out and to sit down with your hiring leaders uh, and stakeholders, like does this match up to how their, their worldview is? Uh, setting that up and then designing your data to match that so that you're speaking a common language. Uh, too often I, I've seen where recruiting will be speaking one language and the business will be speaking another language. And there's a lot of you know friction in between those that can be generated. So taking the time to generate the, the flow uh, and the taxonomy that matches what the recruiting team is doing, and what the business wants, uh, and then aligning on the core uh, OKRs that you want to support that, whether that's time to fill, channel, some of those things that we looked at in the demo, that's that's really where I would encourage folks to start. Andon, what do you think? How do you set expectations for your recruiting teams at uh, Grammarly? Yeah, I think um, how we think about that is exactly what Matt said, is you might have uh, different goals or OKRs around what you're trying to achieve from a business standpoint. So how we think about it and how we've thought about it for the longest time is ultimately, your final goal should be your hires and understanding what that hire looked like. Now you can peel that back and you can look at now your on sites or your various other stages within the funnel, but it may not always be the same for every company and what you're trying to accomplish. So at first for us, it was hires. If we start now putting a metric around, we want this amount of on sites or we want this amount of phone screens or things like that. And your metric could be, I really just want quality, hires to bootstrap the team, that may not be the metric that you want to specifically go for. Um, so we think about it as hires, but then we also think about it as priority hires. Are we getting the right folks in the door at the right time? That's key for us. Um, but then I think the final thing that is good for us, um, and I think for any company, is always tracking your accept rate and accept reasons. Um, because that ultimately is the story that you're telling from a company standpoint, and that should be healthy because otherwise you have other issues that you need to dissect through the process. Great, thank you. So when you're reporting to your company's leadership team, how do you tell a compelling story and bring insights that matter to them? And that question is directed for Matt to start with. Yeah, so I think just at a high level, what I've seen companies focus on is I would just reiterate again, speaking the same language. Uh, so I think that starting with, you know, simply reviewing your company's goals. So if you're supporting the head of engineering, what are their goals? Uh, and, and, you know, hearing them talk about that and then take that and work that back down to what your hiring goals are and how they support those overall business goals. Um, one that helps in the reporting to the executives, because if you have those shared goals, that your objectives are aligning to their objectives, you're going to be you know, kind of on the same path together, which is going to be a much smoother way of working together. I think it also helps with recruiting teams as well when you look at it in that fashion, uh, because then you're also helping to see your team members, the work that they're doing every day, how that rolls up into your company's overall goals, uh, you know, very clearly and very directly. So 
we can often get lost in our teams in you know the number of uh, calls that we have to do, the number of outreaches we have to do. It can seem like a an endless slog at times, you know, for different folks. But uh, being able to see that north star of like the reason I'm doing this is to help us meet this large goal for our company, right? So it works not only with uh, reporting up to executives, but also with motivating and inspiring the team as well. So getting those shared goals uh, and then translating those into what are the talent outcomes that are required to hit those goals. And then what do you think? What has your experience with that been like? I, I think it's right on. Um, I think we've all been in a uh, an environment where the data that you have and the data that uh, folks on the partnership stakeholder team want um, can vary drastically depending on your team, you know, the the audience, et cetera. Um, and and so I, I always relate back to a funny story. It's like, you know, you might have one team that all of a sudden says, hey, you know, back in 2016, that engineering specific pipeline, can you go back and look at how many senior folks applied over time? Right. And right. And, and you're and you now start catching yourself pulling data to pull data without and you create more problems rather than finding your big rocks to find in terms of uh, getting the solutions toward. Um, so one of the things that I'm a big believer in is really understanding where you're at as a company, what your goals are, like we we talked about. Um, and we actually did surveys to understand at different levels of stakeholders what's important to them and what would they deem as the health metrics for the company that would be healthy. And so then what we think through is we create reports around those different health metrics um, and, and, and we're still kind of iterating on this uh, at Grammarly, but um, one of the things we care about is, okay, sure, if it's urgent, let's go do a data pool to understand what those challenges are so we can fix them immediately. But if it's not, let's maybe include that into a future iteration of a report and go from there. Um, so one of the things that we care about specifically right now um, are in, insights that we present are again the hires again they separate um, making sure our story we care about our story is it resonating with candidates are people getting into our funnel and saying yes i want to work there um, but then we also care about we're at a scale uh, where we find one particular metric very important and that's the source of the hire where should we be putting our time and money and effort into um, should we be boosting up referrals are we at the referral rate that we need to? What, what, what does that look like? Are we at the sourcing rate that we need to? Are we at the inbound rate that we need to? And being able to like work through those and put our efforts into those different areas really helps us. Um, but that, that's, again, it really depends on your executives, your leadership team, your OKRs and your goals and where you wanna go as a company. Um, and, and per what Matt says, I think it's, it's gonna be slightly different per company. Great, thank you. This next question is for both of you, although let's start with Matt. How do you use the insights from the data to forecast and do capacity planning? Yeah, that's a great question. It's uh, near and dear to my heart. And I think uh, it dovetails nicely with what Andon just mentioned about the source of hire, right? So that's the analysis that we do a lot with customers is we look at when we break it down into either departments or specific pipelines within a department, we really look closely at where have the hires historically come from, right? So we can segment those into inbound and outbound channels, uh, and those are different strategies. So for example, you might have a team that's more customer service focused. You might look at the hires for that team over the last year and see that 85% of those are generated by inbound applicants, right? And so when you look at that, you can really start to use that to factor in how many people do you need on that pipeline to actually hit that goal? Maybe a different strategy might suit you better for that particular pipeline. You might look at a digital strategy, a marketing first strategy, because that's already getting you results. So you could accelerate that to, to extend those results. And then conversely, you might look at a different pipeline like engineering managers, for example, a notoriously hard pipeline and find that 80% of the hires come from sourcing and 20% come from referrals, right? Again, that's gonna be a different uh, forecast. It's gonna be a different headcount plan for that team because the nature of the work is different. If we know that the hiring is gonna come from those two channels, uh, that's gonna require a lot more proactive work 
from the team, uh, we want to staff it accordingly. So that's kind of my starting point is look at each pipeline, look at each natural grouping of roles that you work on or geographies, depending on how your company is set up. Look at where the hires come from and then really think critically about how many people are going to be required to meet those goals for each pipeline there. Yeah, I'm, um, I echo that as well. I, I, I care a lot about this particular topic as well. Um, I, I think it's, in my opinion, it's, it's half art, half science. Um, I think that, you know, it's not a perfect equation, although I think Matt and his team are uh, starting to get us closer to that. But um, I, I think that, you know, you, I'm a big believer in making sure we have focus from a recruiting team perspective. Um, and anytime you're in this hyper growth type of environment or growing at a scale that maybe would be a stretch for your particular team to support, um, you should not just put your, your goal as the goal of the business. Um, I think that will cost you a lot of churn. It will defocus efforts. Uh, it will create, I think, sloppiness and quality issues. Um, and so if your goal is to hire 50 people in a quarter and you have five recruiters and your recruiters aren't capable of hitting 10 hires a piece, that shouldn't be your goal. Um, how I like to think about it is look back at your historics as much as possible using that gem data. Look back at the historics and say, hey, you know, I think our recruiters at the, working on these pipelines can support on average five hires a quarter. And uh, I look at that and I add all that up and I say, we feel good uh, supporting this level of rules and give that to the business. Now that might not always be the, the number of roles that you're gonna forecast quarter over quarter because some roles are just a little bit longer in evolving and, and, and maturing because of the market. Um, but so then once you get that baseline capacity, what are the roles that you can support and feel good about focusing enough of your time uh, that you do a quality job? Then look at those roles and those forward thinking mentality and say, hey, well, I actually think we can get this many hires out of those specific roles. Um, and things that might change or variables that could change is, for instance, like where you can, where the half science, half art comes into it is you might have a specific role that gives you very good data and you understand that this role could be filled by a recruiter, you know, within this allotted time. Um, and so you think, okay, our, our recruiting capacity is five hires per that role. But then you look at your recruiting capacity and say, hey, that one recruiter is focused on six different roles. So they may not be able to focus as much time. And so you kind of have to use the art of it as well to, to, to uh, pull your recruiting capacity in. Um, so I'm a big believer in that. And I think it's, it's important to set the right expectations to your stakeholders, plan appropriately, and still provide that quality level of support and not defocus your recruiting efforts, but make sure you're focused on the, on the roles that, uh, that we need to hire for. Great, this next question for Andon is kind of related. And that is, what are the things you're looking for when hiring recruiters to build a high performing team? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, the biggest thing, and I don't say I'll try to break this up into in three different categories here. Um, but the first thing is um, just your result oriented mentality. Um, you know, what, what is it? Do you care about your recruiting craft? Do you uh, care about basically building uh, the, the, the business? And um, well, I don't want to be one of those companies that may say, here's a laptop, go hit a roll, right? And that's your core job. That's not what I mean by result-oriented mentality. But do you have the amount of rigor to say, hey, I want to go and hire for this company and I have the, that type of mentality to, to drive to results? Um, I think that's baseline to all of our core recruiting jobs, you know? And I, I think the second thing is just having that strategic ownership mindset, right? Um, we talk a lot about, you know, having like you're, you're basically, you do a good enough job planning for how much effort you have to put in to hit your hires using data, right? And building out your recruiting strategy to do that. Um, that allows you to have less variables and less movement throughout uh, your, your, your tenure uh, with recruiting because things are constantly changing. So just really 
having that recruiting level of strategy, owning your business, working uh, you know hand in hand with your stakeholders, that you know providing that quality candidate experience, providing that data integrity that allows for you know us to be able to track and be able to understand where you may need to improve on or maybe need to pull back on. And, and that's big for us. Um, the last thing I look for in particular, because we are in this environment, Grammarly is and, and growing and, and scaling, um, and we're looking for people that want and have passion to put uh, their footprint in building the company. Um, and that's stuff out of your core to day to day job. And that could be everything uh, under the sun from really just mentoring folks on the team uh, to, you know, creating a large process improvement that helps the greater team or helps the company or starting, you know, different levels of uh, groups within the team to solve issues, right? It's not a one size fits all type of thing, but someone that cares and is passionate about that recruiting craft to ultimately accelerate others around the, the team. And when you have folks like that all together at one point, I think it provides this team mentality and allows you to, to grow the, the correct way. Thank you. This, this next question is on a similar theme and goes into a little more detail, and that's how do you build and foster an environment and culture that develops recruiters over time? Where are the areas where you'd like to see your recruiters improve? Yeah, I think um, first off, uh, fun. Make sure recruiting's fun, right? And um, and there could be different things about that that's fun, but make sure it's a fun type of environment. Um, I, I get excited about you know recruiting, uh, and maybe everyone has different levels of excitement around what they do. I I particularly um, I remember I can relate back to a story. Um, and, and this is where I use some of the, the new gem, gem dashboards, but I relate back to the story when I used to be a recruiter that would have this, you know, exciting candidate and I would bring them into the process and, you know, all day I would just be refreshing the feedback button, right? And because I cared that they did well in the process. And I, and now I just at a different level, I actually look at the gem dashboards and I refresh it all day. How many hires is the team getting? And celebrate those hires, right? Celebrate it. That's what we want to do. We, we want to be... Uh, excited about growing the company and have impact. So fun. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, just again around that ownership mentality. Recruiting has a, a, a tremendous amount of variables because at the end of the day, you're working with people. You're working with hiring managers, executives, candidates, recruiting team members, and, and people have a lot of variables. There's a lot of things that happen um, with people. And one of the things that I like to foster on my team is, sure, there's constant, constant change. There's constant things that you can't control. But instead of just being a victim of not being able to control those variables, own those variables. Put in guardrails in your process to limit those variables. And when you're driving and influencing and making sure that those variables are not happening at the pace of uh, that could make us unproductive, that is what I like to foster in the team. And that's that ownership mentality where you're driving to make sure those variables, um, you know, don't uh, creep into the process. Um, and I think the last thing for me is, I, I like to almost sometimes call our team like an L&D team or an L&D environment, learning and development. Why are we constantly uh, doing what we do? What, what can we pick up from each other to make sure that we're learning and growing. Um, and, and I'm a big believer on this, whether it's a junior recruiter or a senior recruiter, you always can learn and being able to set ourselves up for success. I think that we can always, you know, read a lot about recruiting. We can always hear about recruiting. We can use a lot of different uh, things in recruiting or tools. Um, at the end of the day, you know, you do it and you feel it and you learn from it and you can move on for that. But if we're sharing that as a greater team and accelerating each other, that's key. That If everyone has that growth, that's key. Um, and I used to learn from some of the most junior people on the team because they come in and they, they think of things different ways. And they say, why don't we do this? And it's like, why don't we do that? That's a great, great idea. Um, and so that's what I like to foster on my team and just make sure we're all growing and we're growing together. 
Great, thank you. Um, this next question goes into a little even further detail, and that is, what are some recruiting metrics that are unique to Grammarly or to your recruiting team to track and gain insights from? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think I already alluded to one of them in particular, uh, but we uh, we care about uh, hires in terms of the priority level. And I, I don't know how unique that is to us specifically, but we have a separate um, criteria or dashboard that talks about where are we hiring from just a pure number standpoint, but where are we hiring from a priority level? Does these Are these critical hires allowing us to grow as a company or are we just hiring just a bunch of roles over here and over there and over everywhere, but we're not actually hitting those critical roles? I think that's very important as you grow because hitting and filling those critical roles um, will ultimately allow you to scale and hit all roles effectively down the line because then you're able to set other folks up for success on the team. Thank you. This next question is from Matt, and that is, how can recruiters use recruiting analytics data to be more intentional about diversifying their teams? Yeah, great question. So, so I think uh, there's there's a couple ways to look at this. I think first it starts with the recruiting team itself. Uh, so I think for those, like many companies will have an R for R program, and I would highly encourage uh, those teams to start there because the, the recruiting team itself should look like the team that we want to recruit going forward for other roles. Uh, and if it doesn't, that's the first thing that I would look at at fixing at a company. Uh, and so I think what our for our teams can do as a starting point is again, you know, take a look at some of those those historical trends. So look at whether it's gender or ethnicity or the confluence of those two variables together. What has your hiring looked like historically? Um, you know, is is that uh, do you have specific challenges with different groups uh, that you're not able to attract at scale? Really thinking critically about why that might be. Uh, and then proactively brainstorming uh, with different groups, potentially ERGs or other folks in the company that may be able to add value there about what should your strategy look like to really generate that top of funnel. So I would do that first and foremost for the R4R program. Uh, and then I would look to scale that to other business units. And I think it works really well rather than doing it as a company-wide initiative, it's gonna look different by department. Uh, so working with each of those leaders directly to come up with a customized plan for what that looks like for their team, uh, the actions that they need to do, both in terms of referrals or interview processes or proactive engagement or events, uh, and then coming up with that, with that plan that's customized to each business leader. So start with the R4R team, take that, scale it, uh, and then bring that out to a customized plan for each business unit leader. That's what I've seen be successful in a lot of the companies that we've worked with on this very topic. Cool, Andon, what do you think? This is a very challenging topic. Yeah, I, I think um, I think again, like it, it goes back to figuring out what those metrics are and ultimately being able to support that and see what the changes will make. Um, I, I don't have too much more to add because I think Matt, you know, described it pretty well. Like it, it's that's what you want to do. You want to understand it and go from there. Um, and I think that's very key to to what to ultimately accomplish your goals there. Thank you. This last question will start with Matt and continue with Andon. And that is, considering that enterprises are in very different places in their adoption of recruiting analytics, what recommendations can you make for teams that are just starting to utilize their recruiting analytics? Yeah, so I, th I think I mentioned this earlier and I think it bears repeating is don't, don't get overwhelmed by the complexity, right? So it's just like uh, any fancy any machine learning or AI or anything like that. It's very easy to get overwhelmed when you're starting out. So if you're really just beginning on this journey, you can start very simply. And so that's by, again, you know, creating the, the things that you want to track, right? And also the groups that you want to track them by, like those two fundamental things uh, and getting agreement on those things will help you start on your journey. And it's okay if folks want to start, you know, with spreadsheets to begin and then progress to a tool like Jam over time as they scale more, uh, that's totally fine. And we see that a lot with a lot of different companies, but really setting up, you know, who, do you, who are you tracking it for? What do you want to track? Uh, and then consistently measuring that over time and less is more when you're starting out. Uh, I think there's a tendency to want to calculate all kinds of different things, but the challenge is if you don't have a purpose-built uh, you know, product or tool, you can't really maintain those over time. So when you're just starting out, align on like fewer metrics done better, uh, and then be really careful about tracking those rigorously over time. 
those would be my uh, initial react, uh, recommendations there. Yeah, yeah, and I and I agree with that as well. I would even um, take it a step farther, and uh, I would say two specific things that you want to focus on, so that when you start understanding the metrics you want to report or the data you want to report, is making sure you have the clean data and to report on it. Um, I think we've all, you know, had an idea of the things that we want to report on. And then we go back to the data and we say, well, is that accurate? Is that accurate? Is this accurate? Um, and so making sure that you put in a process to have that data clean. So when you know that you want to report on that specific benchmark, that metric, et cetera, you can say, yes, I feel pretty confident that this data is accurate. Um, and, and even taking that even further is making sure that you know, your stages in the recruiting process are the stages that you want and that they're consistent across the company. Keep that in mind as you as you grow, because you may have one particular, you know, uh, role that you're working on and the stages could be very different compared to another role. So when you're comparing the two and saying, hey, this one's efficient and this one's not, it's really not comparing them at all because you can't tell because they have different stages and you don't know how to do it. So group stages together, and then that way you can really benchmark roles against roles, apartments against apartments, and ultimately even from an industry standpoint. So make sure you get those consistent stages, overhaul them, and then make sure that data is clean. So once you do decide on, the, on this particular health metrics you want to report on, you have that information and you're not constantly going back and saying, well, it could be accurate, it could be not. And it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't provide you credibility uh, amongst your company. I would just add one thing to that too. I, I love all of that, Andon, and I think it ties back to what you mentioned about uh, with your teams of that that improvement uh, mentality, right? And so that that concept of you know data is everyone's responsibility. So if you see something, say something. Uh, if you see something that that's broken or wrong or isn't set up properly, like encouraging our teams to proactively think about like how would they fix that. And then having them feel empowered to bring that uh, to leaders, to stakeholders, and, and work on that together, so we get that good, clean data to make great decisions. Great, thank you, Matt and Andon, for that insightful discussion. We'd like to open the webinar up for Q and A and encourage attendees to submit their questions using the chat feature. So let's jump in and address some of the questions that were submitted by the audience. The first of which is, and I think this is a question from Matt. Why is there no attention paid to the schools attended and the degrees held by candidates versus merely raw numbers? Yeah, that's a great question. That, that's fantastic feedback. So in the product today, uh, you're not able to sort uh, by degrees uh, specifically. There are some companies we work with that track that data in their ATS. Uh, we can ingest that data and we can search and do that type of analysis for them. Uh, and that's definitely something that we're looking at, you know, in terms of future uh, product enhancements. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so the raw numbers, I think uh, it goes beyond that too, because you can dig deeper to understand and think about what are the causes behind the numbers. But over time, we do want to make it more predictive uh, and more insightful so that it will show kind of the why behind some of those numbers there and help provoke the questions to ask based on the numbers. Great. This next, next question I think is also for you, and that is, does GEM accommodate using assessments in the hiring process? and indicate the hiring success rate from adding that as a step in the process. Yeah, we absolutely do. We have a lot of customers uh, that are using that. And so that integrates natively uh, with your ATS. So whatever assessment you're using uh, coupled with your ATS platform, we again will bring that in and we would surface that in those analytics that I, I demoed. Uh, and so that would just be simply a separate step uh, in that, in that uh, funnel that we showed and you'd absolutely be able to see uh, what the drop-off rates are. And you can also sort it by gender, uh, uh, ethnicity, you know, geo, any way that you want to slice that. So the, the, the short answer is yes, that we do have that. Another gem question, and that is, is the data extractable? How does this platform integrate with Workday recruitment module and employee info? Does this platform have predictive or prescriptive analyti analytics capability? Great questions. Yes, yeah, so those are awesome questions. Um, so with the data extractability, yes, it's highly extractable. So any of the reports that you run in GEM uh, can be extracted to CSV quickly and easily. It's a one-click export. You can also export them as PDF uh, if you want to share them with a leader uh, or the raw link itself to the report. So it can be extracted in a variety of ways. 
uh, the teams are doing. Some, some teams will want to take it out, combine it with other data and, and visualize it differently in Tableau or Google Data Studio, and that's totally fine. Uh, and that works seamlessly. Uh, the other thing I'd mention there too is it respects user permissions based on the ATS. So whatever someone can see in the ATS, they would be able to run those reports within GEM. And if they can't see it in the ATS, they won't be able to report on it in GEM. So we respect those very carefully. Um, with the Workday question, so we specifically natively integrate with the Workday ATS module. Uh, we do not integrate with the employee info module. That's a, that's a separate product within the Workday family. So we are just touching the ATS section of Workday, but not the employee data uh, within the Workday stack there. Um, with the last question around predictive productivity and uh, analytics and prescriptive analytics. So this is definitely on the roadmap uh, where we're of the same mind. Uh, so whomever asked this question, uh, we definitely want to bring that to the product more. So we do have some of that today, uh, but we definitely are looking at ways that we can surface that and would love uh, folks feedback going forward on how we can best do that. Great. This next question is for Andon, and that is, do you offer your recruiters a bonus for each hire? And if so, do you think it affects your team's efforts? Um, just really quick going back, I'm really looking forward to the predictive analytics piece of it. Um, but no, so I, I think it depends on, regarding bonuses where you're at a stage of the company. I think bonuses from an incentive standpoint could be great if your processes are very rigorous, they're very much in place, uh, the valuation pieces are key. Um, and the one thing that you're trying to incentive is just pure productivity. I think where it could be a negative piece um, is, you know, sometimes it can create push uh, where recruiters might push a hire that may not be a good fit. Um, and so if your company is focused on ultimately growing and, and, and finding that quality of hire and making sure they're a great fit, um, numbers or just churning just the numbers out uh, could be a negative incentive and create some level of overcompetition and possibly folks that are going through your funnel that might not, uh, shouldn't be there. Um, so I think of it as like, one, it will increase some volume, but I think it also can negatively, depending on where you're at from a company standpoint, uh, increase highly, you know, more competitiveness um, and create more challenges because people are getting pushed through the funnel opposed uh, to finding the right person in the funnel. Great, thank you. Our last and final question is for Matt, and that is, does this platform compare company data against industry benchmarks for talent acquisition? Yeah, great question. I love this question as well. Uh, these are all awesome. Uh, so basically today it does not, uh, but I think, you know, as GEM has grown, we've been around since 2017, we now have over, over 800 customers globally. Uh, so we're really becoming a platform where we're going to be able to surface these over time. Uh, so this is definitely something that's top of mind for the team here, but we want to be able to show you not only how fast is your team running in terms of your hiring funnel, but also be able to give you a comparison within your industry that's relevant for the type of roles to show you how others are doing as well. So we're definitely looking at this and hope to be able to share more on that in the near future. Great. Thank you, Andon and Matt, for an amazing panel discussion. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this fantastic webinar. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.